Don't you love Mother Mary? Yes. You know, we want to fall in love with them. Don't just love them like, you know what I mean, with a cold, you know, rational love. That's good. We need more than that. A passionate love we should love them with. Amen? Amen. As Cardinal Newman said, St. Cardinal Newman, heart to heart. We speak to God from heart to heart. Hallelujah. Now we'd like to look a little bit at the scriptures again because we Catholics were not known for our biblical audacity, but we should be. And so we're going to, I'm going to ask you to read Psalm 119 a little bit with me and we'll see how this ties in immediately with Our Lady of Fatima and with God's plan for the salvation of this country and this world. This is Psalm 119. There's many, many things we can learn from the book of Psalms. Almost every line is a jewel from heaven. If you can't read the whole Bible, open your Bible to the book of Psalms when you get home and just try to read one Psalm a day for the rest of the year. That in itself could make you holy. One Psalm a day. St. Therese of Lisieux says, just read one paragraph a day her little way, you know what I mean? Don't try to read a whole chapter or a whole book. Read one paragraph a day of the Word of God. And maybe the book of Psalms is the best place to start. Why? Because that was Jesus' prayer book too. When he said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He was not despairing, he was quoting the book of Psalms. Would you give me a break? He was quoting the book of Psalms. That comes from the book of Psalms, amen? He was fulfilling prophecy. That's what he was doing. He never despaired, and nor shall you or I. So here's Psalm 119. Psalm is one of the longest ones. It's exceedingly beautiful. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. So this will teach you really how to pray. The book of Psalms teaches us how to pray. It is the prayer book of the Jewish people, and it is what we priests use in our briefly every day. The book of Psalms. Would you say this, beloved, after me to God? Lord, let my cry come before you. Lord, let my cry come before you. Teach me by your word. Teach me by your word. Let my pleading come before you. Let my pleading come before you. Save me by your promise. Save me by your promise. Let my lips Proclaim your praise. Let me stop right there. You see, that is Catholicism. I'm going to speak right now, and you may get mad at me, and I apologize in advance, because I can feel when I'm with any congregation, I know what's there. I can feel your souls, and you can see half of it. We have a lot of complainers here today. Ooh, baby, I'm being anointed right now <laughs> by the Holy Spirit all over my body, the electricity. We have too many complainers in the church today. I can feel it. I, I know it's from the Holy Spirit. Maybe not here. Maybe, you know, it will be like Mr. Perfect here. Mr. Pretty Nice Guy here, you know. But when we get out to the car, we start complaining. <laughs> this, beloved, complaining and grumbling is the language of hell. It's the language of hell. I've been there. That's all they do is grumble and complain. The language of heaven is the language of love. And love celebrates. Love celebrates the beloved. And love rejoices in what is good. Amen? Amen. And so beloved, the Lord says to implore you to be real Catholics. Do not make excuses. I can feel somebody's heart right now. Go make excuses right now for your complaining. Well, Father doesn't know what I've been through. Oh, yes, I do. I do know what you've been through. Don't ever justify your sins. Amen? Amen. The Bible says it's infallible. Is the Bible infallible or not? Yes. Is it the infallible word of God? Yes. Would you say this after me? Be ye not, Be ye not. Grumblers. grumblers. You just said the word of God. <laughs> Let's do it one more time. Be ye not, Be ye not. Grumblers. grumblers. Now try this, okay? Say this. I will not be. I will not be a grumbler. A grumbler. Oh, are you telling me the truth? 
Because that's music to God's ear. Did he mean it? Yes. Boy, he must be sick of all the complaining. You know what I mean? A real Catholic does, doesn't go around that we all get the temptation, right? There's a, there's a demon of complaining. He's ugly, let me tell you. If you ever seen a demon, they are ugly. He's ugly. And he will come after everybody, including priests and bishops and popes. If you feel that, start to take hold of your heart. Beloved, when you feel that, you got to do something like this. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Start praying to the Virgin of Praise and Thanksgiving. Kneel down. Start praying to Hail Mary. If it doesn't work, then you go like this. <laughs> You want to give it a try? <laughs> All who want to try, if you want to try, would you raise your right hand? All who want to try with me. Raise your right hand. I'm going to bless your hands to make them holy. <laughs> so you get a holy slap. A holy slap. Are you ready? Everyone, not, everyone wants to become a saint now. Let's going to slap the grumbling right out of our cheeks. Are you ready? One, two, three. <laughs> You look better. You just knocked it right out of you. Now, it, it's, it's hilarious, but if you read the lives of the saints, it's what they actually did. Amen? Yes. Where do you think I got it from? I got it from St. Francis. Amen? Yes. Do you want to be a saint? Yes! Then start slapping yourself today. Yes. Amen? Amen? So you got to stop being complainers and grumblers. We can't do that. We are men and women of praise and thanksgiving. Amen? Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And you'll see your whole outlook on your life will change in 24 hours. Everything will change in 24 hours. So I'll tell you a true story, okay, about complaining and thanksgiving, the difference between them. There was this beautiful married couple, and they had two little boys who were, they were twin brothers. They were kind of like John Paul and Anthony. They were two twin brothers. And this beautiful married couple, they loved their sons, and they were a little bit well-to-do. They had a nice spread, and a lot of acreage, like a farm and a ranch, a beautiful house, and it was time for the little boy's birthday. And these little guys, their birthday was coming up. They are about seven years old or eight years old. It was their birthday coming up in the following week. And dad and mom told the little boys, you know, they had a surprise for them. And of course, mom and dad knew what these little boys, what they wanted, because they talked about it year round. And what did these two little boys want for their birthday? They wanted their own pony, their own horse. Who wouldn't, do you know what I mean? They wanted their own little pony. So mom and dad didn't tell them, but they, they went hunting and searching, and they found two beautiful little twin ponies for the two little twin boys. But they kept them hidden in a friend's house, at a friend's stables, you know. And the little boys noticed, though, that a few weeks before their birthday, that the carpenters showed up, and they were out in the back, in like the ranch, in the backyard, and they were building a structure. And the little boys were getting like more and more excited with each passing day, because it certainly looked like they were building stables. And these boys were ruminating between themselves could it be that mom and dad are going to make our dreams come true and get us our own little pony, our own horse? Well, the carpenters worked hard for several weeks and the little tiny stables were up and it came time for their birthday and the little boys, they were kind of excited out of their minds. And mom and dad said, okay boys, it's time for your birthday present and they didn't say a word about what it was. But the little boys, they weren't, you know, they were pretty smart. They sort of figured what it was. Mom and dad put a blindfold on the two little boys and they marched them outside by hand to bring them to the little stables and they opened the door. And there were two doors that went into the stable. So one boy, one twin went in one side, one went in the other. And the blindfolds were still on. And then when they went inside, they, they placed the one little boy right in front of his stable and the other little boy in front of his. And then mom and dad said, okay, take off your blindfolds. And when mom and dad said that, they left. They ran out to the back of the stable where there was a peephole. 
If they had the carpenter put in, they wanted to just catch everything and even take pictures. So they went back to see the little boy's expression when they would take off the blindfolds. So the little boys quickly took off their blindfolds and they looked, they both were surprised, uh, shocked. And the one little boy, what he saw in front of him was a whole bunch of fresh straw with some fresh horse poopy all over it. <laughs> and so did the other boy, there was a good mat of fresh straw and some horse droppings there. They were just nice and fresh and they smelled really good, you know what I mean? <laughs> and so the little boy saw that, and so the one little boy seeing that, he must have been like a baptized Catholic, uh, because he started complaining. <laughs> And he got angry and he began chastising. He, they, they didn't see mom and dad. Mom and dad were gone. They know mom and dad were observing them from the people. And they said, how could they dare do this to me? How could they dare do this to us? They would that blankety blank blank. And they couldn't believe the words out of an eight-year-old boy's mouth. They put that blankety blank stuff there. For me, he got so mad he took his boot and he kicked some of that poop against the wall. <coughs> He was mad and he was complaining and grumbling and cursing. And mom and dad looked at each other like, <laughs> they couldn't believe what they saw. So they went to the other people and the other little boy was there and he took off his people, and he took off his, his uh, blindfold and he, he looked down and he, he got the poop and made three little balls. <laughs> And he began to juggle the ball. <laughs> and he was whistling and smiling. And mom and dad are like. <laughs> so finally, they come back in. They, they talk to the two boys. And the one, of course, son, you are naughty. I couldn't believe what we heard from your mouth. And they turn to the boy. But son, what were you thinking? That's so beautiful. He said, well, mom and dad, I saw the horse poop. I figured wherever this horse poop, there's got to be a horse somewhere. <laughs> so next time you see horse poop, start juggling. <laughs> Amen? <laughs> start juggling the next time you see horse poop, because there's a pony waiting for you. <laughs> Amen? <laughs> you see, that other little boy, he had the right attitude, didn't he? Yeah. Yeah. So when the cross comes into your life, kiss it. Don't complain about it, kiss it. There's always a hidden joy behind that cross. Amen? Amen. There's always a pony somewhere. Amen? Amen. So beloved, we want to be authentic Catholics, and that's more than just saying the rosary. And forgive me, more than just going to Mass. What good does it do to say the rosary and go to Mass and then complain the whole rest of the day? And you know, that's why so many of our masses are dead. Because everyone in the church, 95% of them, are all complainers and grumblers. And they, and they walk in the church, they stop complaining and grumbling here, but it's still going on up here, all during the mass. Amen? Amen? So the attitude with which we do things is vitally important. And that's why the Lord Jesus Christ said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. The Catholic Church is the true church. We are the church of the truth. It's not enough. The devil knows the truth as well. The Bible says the devil believes and trembles. So the Lord is not just the truth. He is the way and the truth. The way you live the truth is vital. Amen. Amen. The devil knows the catechism forwards and backwards. He knows the whole Bible backwards in Latin. Doesn't matter if you know the truth if you don't live it. The devil knows the truth. He just hates it. Amen. Amen. So the way you live the truth will result in a life lived for God. He's the way, the truth, and the life. And so the way of the Catholic is just to embrace the truth, but with love and with joy, not with complaining. Amen. Comprendes, yeah. amigos? See, does it make sense? Yeah. It's so important. Well, God, why are you sending me to hell? I went to Mass every day. Yeah, but you complained all the way there and all the way home. 
The way we worship, the way we live, is vitally, vitally important. I would put it maybe this way. If Jesus is the truth of the gospel, Mary is the way. That's the way we follow him. We follow Jesus, the truth, through her. We follow him in her way. Amen? Amen. And what did Mary say? My soul proclaims the greatness of the Lord. My spirit rejoices in God, my Savior, for he has looked with favor on his lowly servant. From this day, all generations will call me blessed. The Almighty has done great things for me, and holy is his name. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. So it's not enough for me to teach you. We've got to practice now, okay? Would you put your hands like this in front of you, everybody? All future saints, would you put out your hands? <laughs> would you say this after me? We're going to, we're going to, got to practice a little bit, right? We've got to practice. You say this, I praise you, Lord. I praise you, Lord. I love you, Jesus. I love you, Jesus. I praise your holy name. I praise your holy name. You are beautiful. You are beautiful. You are amazing. You are amazing. And I love you. And I love you. I will praise you forever. I will praise you forever. Your majesty is resplendent. Your majesty is resplendent. Your truth is perfect. Your truth is perfect. Your way is lovely. Your way is lovely. You are everything. You are everything. And I worship you forever. And I worship you forever. Hallelujah. 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 And now give to God, like they do in heaven, give to God a round of applause. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Isn't it good to be Catholic? Yes. Now remember, if you start grumbling, you've, you've been excommunicated. <laughs> we are people of praise and thanksgiving. Even when things go wrong, you just see the good start juggling when things get bad. Amen? Amen. Now, I know my time is running out, but I'm going to tell you a true story, okay? I've shared this with a few groups, and I don't know if I've shared it with those of you who are here. Give you one example, one simple example of how true this is, how the Lord taught this to me at a very young age. In our modern times, the one thing we don't really like, one cross we don't like, is a flat tire on the highway. <laughs> That's some horse poop, you know what I mean? <laughs> so when you get a flat tire, you have to start juggling, you can't start complaining. You never do that because God is in charge of everything. Amen? Amen? Is he not in charge? Yes. Can you get a flat tire if God says no? no? No. If you get a flat tire, God has willed it for some reason. Isn't that funny? But he's trying to save your soul, right? He's trying to save your soul. No one becomes a saint on cheesecake and ice cream. <laughs> you become a little overweight on cheesecake and ice cream, but you won't become a saint. Amen? Amen. Now, nothing against cheesecake and ice cream. If you can find me some tonight, I'll have some afterwards. <laughs> Every now and then it's good. But we become saints through carrying the cross with a smile. We carry the cross with a smile, like Catherine Doherty from Madonna House in Canada, the woman who's becoming a saint in Canada. That poem she wrote, she said the soldiers, they lacerated Jesus, spit at him, made fun of him. Then they threw this big, heavy cross on his shoulder. And Jesus took the cross, she said, and he slapped his cheek against the cross, and he smiled. He slapped his cheek against the cross, and he smiled. The Bible says he knew he would not be put to shame. Amen? And so we were made into saints by carrying the cross well. I had a flat tire on the way home one day, many, many years ago. And I had in the car with me a beautiful old lady, kind of a, kind of a holy woman. We'd come back from a prayer meeting. I think I was 19. This beautiful old lady, I think we'll call, we'll call her Nina. Uh, she was about maybe 70. She'd had a stroke. 
So she was kind of paralyzed and could hardly talk. But boy, she was filled with the zeal of the Holy Spirit, the fire of love. She was filled. We came back from a prayer meeting. We're going over the bridge. I'm from Tampa, Florida. So we're going over the Gandhi Bridge. And the, like a bit of it goes up pretty high. And then, then you coast down. And I got to the very top of the bridge. And when I got to the top, I got a flat tire and my car broke down. I mean, the engine wouldn't work. And so I started flip-flopping down on whatever momentum that I had. And I'm, I'm going down the bridge, and I said, Nina, pray, we have no power. <laughs> and course, she, was, she wasn't good for anything, but she was good for prayer. <laughs> and boy, she was praying, and we, I said, keep it going, keep it going, keep it going, keep it going, keep it going. <laughs> we made it down the bridge and over the water, right, it stopped right when we made it to land. Thank goodness, because it wasn't huge. It used to be the longest bridge in the world, the Gandhi Bridge. So we made it to the other side to the land, and I got out. And lo and behold, there's a gas station across the street. It's um, like really providential. And so I said, Nina, I need to push the car over there to the gas station. But you know, there's two ways of traffic, two going this way at like 65 miles an hour, two going this way, 65 miles an hour, getting on and off the bridge. I said, Nina couldn't help me. She couldn't even, she couldn't even turn the steering wheel. She couldn't hold with her hands, were kind of frozen, you know? So I had to do the steering wheel and open the door and push it myself across this traffic at 65 miles an hour. And somehow she was praying and the traffic was gone. So I got halfway through. I couldn't believe it because it's constant traffic. I got halfway through and there was traffic coming the other way, but some men at the gas station saw me, came over and helped me. And with their help, I got it across the rest of the way. And we got in there, the flat tire was easy, put some air in it, no problem at all. But we didn't know why it wasn't starting. And I said, man, could you look at this? Any mechanics here? And they were, they came, they put up the hood, they were looking at my car. And they're trying everything to fix my car. It never broken down like that before. I'm watching them. And Nina's laughing, she's just smiling and laughing. And I'm saying, the, you know, God is here. Whatever reason, he's doing this. So I'm watching the men pray they can find what it is, when suddenly the Holy Spirit speaks to me. And you should speak to every 19 year old in the United States of America, they should all be hearing the voice of the Holy Spirit. Amen? Amen. Everyone here should hear the voice of God. I am the Good Shepherd, my sheep know me, I know them, they hear my voice. Amen? Amen. You can hear his voice too, but you've got to get serious. As I told somebody earlier today, you get serious with God and he'll get serious with you. You play games with God, you'll back off. Amen? Everyone can hear the voice of the Lord. Amen? Amen. Everyone can hear him. Amen? Amen. Hallelujah. Today, ask him for that grace. And he told me as I'm standing there, he said, that woman there, there was a woman putting gas, it was a busy gas station. It was a middle-aged woman. He said, give her a prayer card. Oh, okay. So I walked up to this lady, I didn't know her, at the, at the pump. I said, ma'am, can I give you this? She said, oh, thank you. She says, can I talk to you? Sure. So she finished gas and she pulled her car back around behind mine, out of the way of the pumps. She pumped up her, she was behind my car. And while the men are working, she and I are talking and Nina comes in and we start talking about Jesus and the Eucharist and the Catholic faith and the assumption of our baby. We talked about the seven sacraments, and I gave her a Bible, and I gave her a rosary, and I gave her some more holy cards. By the time I finished, she had like a car, like a library in her car. <laughs> I gave her all these beautiful things. And then she said, thank you so much. I said, you're, you're welcome. She says, can I ask you one question? Sure. She said, why did you come over to talk to me and give me that card? I said, well, God told me to. She said, I was heading to Tampa to kill myself today. I was heading to Tampa to kill myself this afternoon. She said, I'm not going to do it now. Oh no, I'm going back to church, she said. And I'm looking at Nina, Looney's looking at me like, whoa. 
And she jumped in her car and she drove off with the biggest grin you've ever seen in your life. The most beautiful God sound. Honking her horn and waving at us like a crazy lady. I'm going back to church. I'm not going to do it. You've renewed my life, she said. And she took off. I look at the mechanics, I look at my car. And it went through me like a lightning bolt. I said, men, yes, back away. Back get what? Back away. They backed off from the car. I sat in and turned the key and it started right up. I knew what happened! I got it! My car died so I could save a soul! The soul was saved and my car started again! horse manure start juggling. <laughs> Amen? Yeah. There's always a reason why. Amen? Yeah. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Should I tell you one more story? Yes. Do you have time? Yes. Okay, one more. <laughs> We're having fun, aren't we? Yes. It's always fun to follow Jesus. If you're bored, you're not following Jesus. Amen? Yeah. It's that easy. If you're bored, you're not following God. Go to confession. <laughs> so, after this event, maybe a year or two later, I was in North Carolina visiting my family, and I got a job at a local restaurant there to help my daddy, who was getting sick. So I got a job to help support my family in North Carolina, and joined the local youth group, beautiful youth group in Asheville, North Carolina. So. I had a long day at the restaurant and I was driving home and as uh, it's like late at night, I had a late shift. I worked like from 3 o'clock in the afternoon to about 11.30 at night. It's an all night restaurant. So I left close to midnight and I'm getting in my car to drive home to my parents' house and the Lord says to me, visit Bobby. And I said, well Lord, it's, you know, I'm trying to explain things to God. You know what I mean? <laughs> He, he, kinda, he needs my help, you know what I mean? I'm like your secretary. So I said, God, you know, it's kind of late. And he said to me, I know, but um, visit Bobby. I said, well, Lord, Bobby's, Bobby is tall and his parents are even taller. And if I knock on their door after midnight, they might send me to the moon. You know what I mean? His parents were huge. Bobby was tall, like six foot three. His dad was like six foot five. His mom was like six foot six. <laughs> I don't knock on that door at midnight. I mean, the last you ever see of me, you see. And he said to me, I know, but visit Bobby. So, I mean, when he says it three times, I know he means business. So I said, okay. So I drove, not home, and I drove to Bobby's house in a neighboring little city. And I'm scared to death, because I think his mom and dad are gonna just yell at me or do something. So I go and I say a, a rosary on the way, and especially emergency prayer as I'm walking up the sidewalk, you know what I mean? And then I knock on the door, not knowing what to expect. And the door opens, and there is his mother, about twice as tall as I am. She says, hey, Jim, you come to see Bobby? Come on in. I mean, it's like 12.30 now. I, mean, I don't usually visit friends at 12.30, you know what I mean? And she says, don't you welcome me like she's expecting me? You come to see, come on in. You know where his room is? And no, ma'am, he's down in the basement. Okay, I was just so stunned. And I went down, and there, Bobby had a man cave. The whole basement was his. It was the coolest apartment I've ever seen. It was just rigged for a young fellow. So I was like 19, he was probably 21. He was one of the leaders in our youth group. Oh, one of the greatest guys I ever met. I mean, he, had, he, had, he had a tall guy with a beard, uh, unusually, you might say, like kind of wise for his age. Uh, kind of tranquil, a wonderful fellow, and I was just glad to be with him. I, I like, like people like that, you know, these manly men. I, we talked about some awesome things, and we had the most wonderful conversation. I said, man, I really liked your apartment. And he showed me around, put some music on, and we talked, and we talked, and we talked about Jesus and Mary for like more than an hour. It's the best thing in the world to talk about the ones you love. Amen? Amen. We talked for a long time. 
And finally, it's like 1.30, close to, I said, you know what, Bob? I better get home. It's kind of late. He said, sure. He said, Bob, you enjoyed it so much, he said. He said, by the way, Jim, why did you come over? <laughs> I said, well, I don't know. The Holy Spirit told me to. And he put his head down. He said, Jim, I was going to hang myself tonight. And he pointed. I'm getting emotional. I didn't even notice before. There was a noose hanging in the bathroom. I was going to hang myself today. So brothers and sisters, when life throws you a curveball, go with it. Amen? Amen. Alleluia. Alleluia. And of course his life was saved, again, by a little nutcake like me. <laughs> God saved his life. All it was was love. Amen? Just a little bit of love. Alleluia. Alleluia. Now beloved, our lady came to save the nations at Fatima. We had a noose hanging called communism to destroy the entire world, to put the world to death. Communism has been condemned by the Holy Fathers a dozen times in official encyclicals. You know, communism is actually sinful. First of all, it's anti-God, it's anti-Catholic, it's actually anti-morality. All of our sexual, you know, freakiness we have now in our country, it was planned in Russia and brought into this country on purpose, including the homosexual movement. All that was planned in advance. Did you realize that? Yes. You can read, read Bella Dodd. Bishop Shane converted Bella Dodd. She was a top-ranking communist member. You should read her book about this. This has all been proven. It's absolute fact. We were in a suicidal mode when Our Lady came to Fatima. And you remember how the sun danced in the sky yeah. on the last apparition? And then what happened at the end of that dance? It crashed. It went flying down to the ground. And there are photographs. You know that, right? It's black and white photographs of the people kneeling down, men, women, and children. They all thought it was the end of the world. And people began crying out for mercy. And they say that they were confessing their sins publicly, everybody. It's kind of embarrassing, isn't it? They didn't care. That son was coming. I'm going to get confessed right now. And they all pulled out their sins. And that, that giant flame called the sun, it was a flame of destruction. And Lucia said later that Michael the Archangel was in the air next to Our Lady. And Mary made a motion to Michael. And he put out a sword and stopped it from hitting the earth. Through Mary's intercession, using the angels, that destruction did not happen. And the idea is that God was given a prophetic warning to the world that there is destruction coming. Destruction is coming. And only Our Lady can save us from this destruction through prayer and through the angels. Amen? Amen. And so in place of that flame of destruction, Mama is giving us a flame of love. There's another kind of flame. There's a flame to do just the opposite, to heal and transform the world. And this flame of love you want to start using in your rosary to stop the destruction that's already overtaking the country. Amen? Amen. The only reason it's happened is we've, we've not prayed. We've failed to pray. Most Catholics don't even go to Mass on Sunday, and those who do, they say only 20% believe in the Eucharist. So we are in trouble, are we not? But all God needs is a small group like this with great faith and the flame of love. It's the love. You see how she appeared at Fatima and you see the, the heart and the flame? It was already there. The flame of love was already there at Fatima. The flame of love. We want that flame in our fingertips and in our hearts. Amen? Amen. But I want to tell you what's going to come. This evil will be defeated. It will not win. When George Washington had his vision of the Virgin Mary in his tent at Valley Forge, you know he was baptized on his deathbed, right? Yes. He was baptized Roman Catholic on his deathbed by a Catholic priest, George Washington. He had a vision of Mother Mary, 
And this final invasion of China and Russia and the Mohammedans coming to our country was given the end of that vision. He saw these little, what he, what he said were campfires across the landscape Mama made out for him. He was in his tent at Valley Forge, the captain's tent. And he saw these little tiny campfires on this map that was in front of him supernaturally. And he looked closer at these little campfires they were lighting up across the country from east to west. Which is truly prophetic. You know why, don't you? Because we weren't a country yet. We were only 13 colonies. We were 13 little colonies. He saw the Pacific and the Atlantic Ocean completely. It was prophetic. You see it more ways than one. He saw these fires all over the continent. And he looked closer and he realized that those campfires were small groups of Christians with their hands raised in the air, pleading with God to save the country. And when enough campfires were lit, he said suddenly an army of millions and millions of angels came down over this country and pushed all those three armies back across the Atlantic, back to their own places. And Mama said this country was saved, would win that final battle, would remain in tranquility to the end of time. That's what Mary said to our first Catholic president. Amen? Amen. We are in that now. Amen? Amen? And what Mama needs is for us to raise our hands to her son and to pray for this victory, for the flame of love to bring the angels down over the earth. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I have about 10 more pages of notes. I'll see you next year. We'll finish those. <laughs> Shall we have a healing service? Yes. Yes. We're going to pray for the spirit of health and joy in all of us. Amen. 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 That you, to put it in a nutshell, become a saint. I'm going to pray that you become a saint. Is that okay? Yes. It costs me something. I'll tell you just this much, nothing more. Tomorrow morning when I wake up, I'm going to be sick. I'm sick after every healing mass and my body is bruised and I feel like I've been like three thugs jumped on me and beat me black and blue. I'm bruised all over my body and in pain. That's what happens after every, oh, just so you know, you need to know that it comes at a price. Amen. Amen. He paid the greater price. I'm paying the smaller price. Even mama paid a price at Calvary. Amen. Amen. Realize that it comes at a price. I'm willing to pay it, but only if you're willing with me to agree with me that you become saints of joy. Amen. Okay, I don't want to waste my time. I'll be glad to pray for your cancer. It'll go away probably tonight. I'll be glad. I don't care. That's not important to me. I'll pray for that. Sure. I want to pray that you become saints of joy. Is that okay? Yes. Ooh, baby, I'm being anointed big time right now. <laughs> now I'm going to be sore tomorrow morning. <laughs>